Well, welcome to our podcast. Here we are again. Uh, today we're in Ben's house. It looks rather like a, a, a Cornish shack or something like that, but um, uh, we're, we're fantastically happy and uh, set up here. Steve Teb is with us this afternoon. Hello, Steve. How are you doing? Good. So good to be with you. Thank you. It's a pleasure to have you on our podcast. Thank um, you. Steve is, oh, well, I'll let you int- introduce yourself, but uh, we've known Steve for a few years as a church at the well. Um, you've been part of worshipping and leading worship for Catch the Fire around this country and around the world. Uh, you've come and done some stuff with us in our church and helped our own worship leaders. Mm-hmm. And so uh, uh, you can tell us a little bit about yourself uh, as we go along. But um, I'm really excited that Steve's here because I wanted to ask you particularly some of those questions that, um, you know, we often see worship leaders up on the stage and you think one thing, but I know that the reality sometimes is a whole other story for what that journey is like, how you enter into being a, an actual worship leader that you do with your full time, how, how much sacrifice there is involved. What the, what the personal devotional life is like behind the scenes as well. Mm-hmm. So I'd love to dig into some of that. So um, I guess the first thing is just to ask you, at the moment you're, you're a worship leader, but how did you get into being a worship leader while I turn off my phone? <laughs> <laughs> That's a great question. So um, I've been leading worship now for around 13 years. I uh, grew up in a Baptist church, uh, spent some of my childhood kind of growing up there little bit more of a traditional vibe of worship and uh, then really kind of went to a new wine Anglican church after that stayed there for about 12 years and uh, then began my kind of journey into worship from there and uh, the way I started was I didn't play any musical instrument Uh uh-huh wasn't a singer either so I didn't have any of that as a luxury uh, at my disposal at that point okay but I had a real heart for worship and uh, I what I did was I had a small piano uh, that was given to me by my parents for Christmas when I was around 13 years old. And I had a guy in my Baptist church at this moment who would just kind of show me a few little things on the piano, but I couldn't read any music, couldn't play any chords or anything like that. Uh, but I had this heart for worship and I wanted to be able to play worship songs. And so I sat with my piano as a 13 year old uh, in my bedroom, one of those small uh-huh. Casio ones. Yeah. and. Uh, spent a few moments really worshipping to an album. It was a Hillsong album from the year 2000. I remember it was Shout to the Lord. And while I was in this moment, I began to pray and close my eyes. And as I closed my eyes, I had this supernatural encounter with God in a moment where the presence of God came upon me. And as I closed my eyes, something came into my hands and uh, was released in that moment and suddenly my hands knew where to move on the piano wow and so it was this really divine god-given moment that really set me up uh from worship even from that moment onwards and there kind of began my journey really within that, worship that is an extraordinary story okay so there's two things i want to just dig into on that first yeah. of all you were 13 and you, you you're using the phrase i had a heart for worship what does that look like as a 13-year-old? I mean, did you, why? Why did you have a heart for it? What had, what had grown there? Yeah, that's a great question. I think at that stage, I don't think I would really have been able to articulate what it was other than that there was something, uh, when I would hear worship music, that would really stir my heart. There was something that would pull on the strings of my heart. I felt like a strange closeness to God when I'd be in the context of worship or hearing worship music. And we know that worship and uh, we know that music is emotive. Mm-hmm. And it tugs on the emotions of hearts in, in any kind of um, environment that you're in. But there was something profound that worship seemed to do within my heart. And I didn't have the words to articulate it at the time. Uh, but it really, really drew me in. There was something in me that just had this desire uh, to worship Jesus and to want to sing songs about him. When I did that, there was something that seemed to satisfy my heart within that. Wow. So it's almost like God had set you up, I suppose. He put something in your soul, in your spirit that responded particularly in connecting with him. Yeah. And so, okay, so tell us about the supernatural download thing. Could you play the piano like Rachmaninoff after that? What, what happened? Absolutely, no. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'd love to say it was exactly like that. It wasn't quite like that. Um, I would say that what God did in the moment was he released the initial gift uh, and what I had to do was then partner with that okay. and, uh, you know, put some practice in as well. So. Uh, it was really a sense of I could start to feel where my hands were meant to move in the music. But initially it was a struggle putting both hands together on the piano. Yeah, and uh, I remember over the, yeah, I remember over the next week praying, God, you've got to help me to put both hands together. And, you know, within a short space of time, I was putting both hands together and able to play 
Uh, so initially it was the one hand particularly that was wow. uh, started to be able to just know where to move. Then it became two. And then I asked God, I said, Lord, I want to be able to actually be able to sing and play at the same time as well. Uh, you know, bear in mind, I'm not a singer either. Okay. Um, so there's two things there. I wasn't a singer and I wasn't able to play and sing at the same time. Prayed the same thing again and within a really short space of time, I was able to start singing the songs and, and playing at the same time as well. No way. That's really, that is ex- exceptional, isn't it? That's wonderful. That's a real treat, a real gift from God. So yeah, so what happened? So um, did that... Um, Tell us a little bit about the, the development of what happened with you in your life. Did you think yeah. that I am supposed to be a worship leader? Because we, you know, we often uh, we have lots of young adults who will come and uh, as part of our church over the years, and they'll often say, "I feel called to worship lead." Um, it's actually only a very few people who end up in that position. So, how did that develop for you? Why do you do what you do? Yeah. So at that stage, um, I didn't have any kind of calling that I was supposed to be a worship leader. I started off really just playing in worship teams, uh, you know, and I think that was a great place for me to start. I had a heart of worship, which I believe is what God is looking for more than anything else, more than any gifting or musicality that you can offer. Actually, the Lord, what God is after is a is a heart that desires to worship him. And so that was the thing I think that the Lord really started with. And so that was my initial beginning stage was playing in worship teams and so I was a part of this new wine church with St Barnabas in uh, Finchley in London yeah, uh, amazing place where God was really moving and uh, that was my initial start was really I came into worship teams so it's stuff about serving somebody else's vision as well just getting stuck in and learning your absolutely trade. and I was really keen for that you know I had no experience I didn't really know anything or know what I was doing but I had a people that were willing to invest in me uh, and you know, asked me to kind of jump on board and serve the vision of of worship there, and so started playing in worship teams, and fell in love with that, and that lasted for a few years um, until I was around sixteen, seventeen, and then right around that time, I started getting to this point where something started changing in me in terms of a desire to start leading the people of God into the presence of God, and I'd never really had that before, and so. I remember, you know, praying, God, is this something that you're actually calling me into? Is this something that's more than what I've ever thought it might be before, but could be a long-term calling, actually? And I started to almost see myself uh, kind of leading worship. And, uh, you know, I think that was something God was starting to reveal in the spirit, uh, that this was something that was coming. And so my initial start was really, I got uh, asked to lead worship in small group settings uh, and in prayer meetings, and this is a you know this is a great thing if you're starting out as a worship leader, and you're entering into that call. Don't worry about the platform. Don't worry about having the mic in your hand or any of that kind of stuff. If the the moment that God calls you into worship, remain teachable and in a place of humility where you're just looking to serve wherever you can. That was kind of how it started for me, and so I really began just in small group settings, leading worship for 10, 15 people, yep. uh, prayer meetings for revival. They were my training ground, but they were spaces I got. Not to a bad really... training ground. No. Like prayer <laughs> meeting for revival, right? So you've got hungry people already Absolutely. And it was really <clears throat> profound. We, you know, we had these times in house groups where people were just out on the floor under the power of God. And I wasn't used to seeing this back then either. Mm-hmm. But there were just these profound times of worship we'd have where we would just give our hearts to the Lord. Uh, abandoned hearts of worship. Uh, we went on for extended times, and to just see what would happen in the spirit. And so, talk to me a little bit about that. Talk to us about that. So, you're you're using again. You're talking about the presence of God, uh, yeah. profound times in worship. That may not be everybody's experience. Yeah. Um, worship for some people is a thing that happens on a you know that we join in with on a stage. But that's not what I'm hearing you say. So, can, what what do you what what what's happening? What, what what how can you put into words what it's like to really encounter the presence of God mm. in worship? Yeah, well, I think you know first, uh, an important thing to point out is that most of us will know worship is a lifestyle. <clears throat> worship goes way more than just beyond the songs that you're singing on a Sunday, and uh, you know those worship times that you have on a platform with a band and with a stage. Uh, worship is something you dedicate your life to. Uh, unto the Lord and so that was really kind of my heart was to learn what it looked like to become a worshipper in everything we do the Apostle Paul speaks about whether you drink whether you eat do it all to the glory of God and so there's a there's a premise we have in the Bible which is that everything that we do would become an offering of worship that we give value and honor to Jesus and so uh, that was really my heart coming into the times of sung worship 
that we entered into in these in these moments. But you know, I think we all have different experiences of what worship looked like for us, different backgrounds. When I was growing up, that was very much standing up, singing one song at a right. time, and then sitting down. And uh, you know, in a lot of more modern churches, it was it was having a time of worship that might be twenty, twenty five minutes long. Um, and that was what I was familiar with at that point. But what I started to experience was what might it look like if we give a little bit more time to the Lord in worship and really allow our hearts to be given in vulnerability and surrender. And that, you know, that requires us to lay down. That requires us to be able to lay things at the foot of the cross and, and come to Jesus with open hearts. And as that began to happen, when I talk about we entered into these times where people were out under the power of God, I mean the manifest tangible presence started to come into the room. People would be crying, people might shake, they might fall down. There are different manifestations that people might experience in the presence of God. Right. Um, but there was an, an intensity, some might feel heat, things like that. There were, okay. I, I would say there were a whole different um, experiences. And, and you're talking about not just the big settings on a Sunday, but in uh, somebody's front room, that sort of thing as well. Absolutely. Yeah. We were in a room just like this. Yeah. Um, you know, really with just 10, 15 people at a time. Right. Uh, but with people singing their hearts out. And it reminded me of, uh, you know, in the scriptures in the book of Acts, when it talks about the upper room right before Pentecost came. And uh, the people gathered in that upper room, waiting and, and praying. Uh, and we were doing that same thing. It felt like we were in an upper room just worshipping Jesus. That's um, really powerful. But the presence of God started to fall upon us. And how does that change your life? So how does that change the everyday? We're talking about worship as a lifestyle, um, as yeah. a sacrifice. Um, I'm thinking of the, you know, the Bible verse where it's like, this is your, um, uh, give, your, give your, the whole of yourself. This is, your, this is a suitable act of worship to God. Yeah. Um, how does how does those kind of times of worship did they translate into a, a changed life outside of the front room settings or the, the the Sunday settings? Absolutely, yeah. And I think that's the the goal you want in in times of worship. I mean, we worship Jesus because He's worthy, and He always will be. Uh, we worship Jesus because that's what you and I have been created to do. But um, you know, one of the things within worship, within that, the beautiful thing we get is to actually be able to experience an encounter the love and the presence of God. And so I think my hope has always been that through worship, we would have corporate times together, whether you're in a house group in a small setting or whether you're on a stage leading a whole church, but that corporately we would love Jesus as best we can. And that those times of loving Jesus would actually lead to lives that become transformed and changed. And so right. for sure, for me, that was one of the things that I think drew me in about worship. Um, you know, we all connect with the Lord in different ways, but one of the things that was profound for me was again, what worship did, it pulled me in, it drew me close to the heart of God. And, uh, there were many times where I would have these times of worship and they, they would leave long lasting change in my life, whether it become, it'd be a peace that I began to experience uh -huh. or a joy or, or a satisfaction. Something seemed to still my heart and give me rest that I didn't really have in many other places. And so... I think uh, when you start to live a lifestyle of worship, you can't help but start to see that overflow and start to bring change and transformation to your daily life. Right. Yeah, I mean, I guess that would be uh, th that would be the hope. And I think we see that in the Bible with people who encounter particularly the presence of God. Mm. You, you've talked about Acts in the upper room. It, it changed people's life when the power of God fell. Um, it changed the whole world, actually, yeah, which is absolutely. the potential of coming into the presence of God in worship yes so we'll come back to your what happened next thing in a minute so okay. let's, let's think about the wider picture for a minute um so for us we've had lots of prophecies and things like that we hear that worship itself is a significant thing um mm. is going to be a significant thing in the next move of God um I'm particularly excited when I hear about say young adults uh in the university campus here in Sheffield or uh, uh around the country with things like David's tent where they, people are just like you know what I'm just, we're just going to worship. We're just going to set aside a day, an evening, a weekend, and we're just going to worship. Um, you, you have your fingers on the pulse of that kind of scene better than mine. What do you see about um, that, that scene of worship around the country, and, and how does it connect, do you think, with what God's wanting to do with us? Yeah, I think it's really interesting because um, you see what God is doing in a lot of places at the moment and there are these hot spots where the the presence of god seems to be burning and increasing in people but okay in the uk yeah absolutely in the uk Great. but one of the primary things i would say that we're seeing uh is a burning in the hearts of, of the believers of god within worship uh like you say you've got people places like david's tent you've got burned 24 7 
you've got Big Church Day out, but you've got places that are more and more becoming open to holding nights of worship, uh, opportunities to just to gather together in communities to worship. And I think there's something really important that's taking place at the moment, one of which is um, historically over time, worship has very often been the warm up. Uh, and you know you see this and you might see this in your own churches or you may have seen it in the past in your own churches but um, there have been very much times over history where worship has often been the thing that's been the appetizer but right. not the main course right. and the preach and the sermon has become the main course yeah we're almost conditioned that way aren't we yeah absolutely and we love the word and we love the preaching sure. of the word it's absolutely incredible but I think what's been really interesting is over the last I'd say five ten years that I've at least seen has been a real kind of shifting of gear where worship has no longer become the warm-up uh, but it's almost become a means of an end to in and of itself and it's become that main course and so no longer are people just gathering to start a Sunday off in worship and then wait for the preacher to get there and arrive and bring the main course but people are actually coming because they're seeing that worship in and of itself on those Sundays in church has a value and a purpose in it and, uh, you know, I think this is in the destiny that God has for the people of God, which is that we are all created to be worshippers. And yeah. um, I'll just share with you something Please. really uh, that God spoke to me about a few years ago. I was We'd done a trip with Catch the Fire Ministries UK and um, we'd done a leader school in Ireland in Belfast. And, uh, you know, we were seeing the love of God breaking in the room. We had a phenomenal times of just worshipping Jesus, seeing God's presence really moved powerfully, uh, miracles were flowing, and people's lives were getting changed. So it was an amazing week, but I remember getting on the plane and coming back, and I had this disappointment in my heart. And I remember asking God, Lord, what was going on? And in that moment, the Lord spoke to me, and uh, because something was happening in my heart that said, God, is this all I'm called to do, right. to lead worship? You know, you've got other people who are doctors here and uh, lawyers and people who have been studying years of degrees and have these professions and it's all I'm called to do, be a worship leader. And uh, God spoke to me really clearly and he said, uh, never belittle the call that you have as a worship leader because when you step in as a worship leader, what you enable people to do is enter into something of their eternal destiny. And that Can I just say that, really say that again me. for us? Say that slowly? He said, never belittle your calling as a worship leader because when you step into leading the people of God into the presence of God, you're stepping into something that enables people to enter into their eternal destiny, which wow. is as a worshipper. Good. And, you know, we see a snapshot of this in the book of Revelation, uh, the angels that are gathered around the throne. And there's this principle that's there that we know, which is that at the end of time, when we're in heaven, there's not going to be an eternal sermon. There's not going to be an eternal altar call or a healing of the sick, but there is an eternal song. And worship is the only ministry that's going to continue for eternity, ah. which is an incredibly powerful so I thing. I can put my sermon notes down, thankfully. <laughs> yeah, yeah, there you go. You can keep going. That's <laughs> Absolutely. Cool. And so, but it really spoke to me in that moment because suddenly yeah. I realized, oh, wow, this is really, really special that as worshipers we're called as a priesthood. And so we have mm. this opportunity corporately as the body of Christ. And he said to me this, he said, you know, some are called to be doctors, some are called to be lawyers some are called to do these different things but he said everyone in the body of christ has a corporate call and that's to be worshipers and so there's something profound in that yeah. in stepping into um an eternal and a corporate destiny that we all have as a body which is to be worshipers and wow. it, it changed my whole paradigm at that point yeah for I, worship i wish the more of us could get hold of that because that's like that would give us a reason to come to church that would give us a reason to ever gather together with Absolutely. christians in whatever setting however many when two or three are gathered I'm there amongst them. Um, what a great motivation to think, actually, I'm just, I'm already stepping into my eternal destiny, which is to worship God and to give him glory and to be in his presence. And it starts now. Yeah. Yeah, that's really an exciting way to yeah, think about it, isn't it? Incredible thing. Yeah, that's so cool. So I just wanted to ask you a question as well about your um, your own preparation. So yes. Um, uh, the, I guess uh, there's a lot of work that goes on in the background, isn't there? Uh, I'd love to hear a little bit about the devotional life for you or uh, and so on. So on stage, you know, we see people and, and this stuff will flow in music. Yeah. There's a spontaneity uh, of let's go here, let's go here where the spirit leads. Um, but there's, there's 
there's there's a lot of preparation that actually goes into that beforehand, isn't yeah. it? I, I think. Yeah, I'm not, absolutely. <laughs> I'm not skilled in that kind of thing. Can you just talk into that a little bit? Yeah, absolutely. Um, preparation is absolutely key for any worship leader, any team, any team I'm working with, and I encourage this for any worship leaders out there, but any musicians and singers as well, um, that to really get into the secret place with God. Uh, that is the best training you ever has a worship leader. It's the best training you'll ever get as a musician and a singer. Um, you know, we know there's a value on excellence, uh, but there's a there's a higher value on, on that of the heart. And I believe that with all my heart, that the greatest training that any of us can actually receive um, and preparation is found in the secret place. And so really for me, before I'm leading worship, I'm getting into the secret place with God. Okay, so the, for, what does that look like? Are you yeah. on your own? Are you? Is it the Bible? Is it yeah. headphones like a footballer? Or, you know, yeah, that... so it can range in a whole different bunch of ways depending on how I'm feeling led. Uh, normally, that means I'm just sitting in my room on my own. Might have some soft soaking music or something like that on or I might just be in stillness before God. But in those moments, I'm really asking the Lord, God, what is your heart? So the, fir the first thing I'll probably do is I'll come into the presence of God uh, by worshipping. You know, the Bible talks about entering his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. So one of my favorite things to do, and I encourage all of us to do this, when you enter in to the secret place with God, is uh, come into that place of thanksgiving. Come in with the, the attitude of praise. And there's something about that that God is really drawn to. And so very often... Um, that almost stirs something in me, but it seems to draw in the presence of God. Absolutely. Even into those places. Yeah. Absolutely. And so that sets me up really well. And then from that point onwards in preparation for the worship set, I'm really asking God, God, what's on your heart for this church or this ministry or this event or this yeah. Sunday, whatever it is, because all of us will be in a range of different contexts on us, you know, for whatever we're doing. Uh, and I'm asking him, Father, what is it you're wanting from us? Um, you know, we know the Bible talks about being a royal priesthood. And uh, this is the mark of a worshipper, is that you're called to be a priest. And uh, one of the fundamental jobs of the priest, primarily, was to minister to the heart of God. And so that's our job, first and foremost, is how do we best minister to the heart of God? So we're asking the Lord, how, what can I do that was going to bless you? Absolutely. Yeah. And at the same time, you want to be pastoral and leading the people. So there's a mixture of, God, how do we bring a sound and an offering that's most pleasing to you? And yet at the same time, um, Lord, would you show me what kind of people are going to be coming, where the needs are at, how I can best lead the people as well. And so I'm really asking God to show me a journey in worship. Uh, you know, okay. I think of it almost like starting at the bottom of a mountain. And what you're hoping is that, Lord, take us to a place where we ascend the hill of the Lord and we get to the mountain top where the place where your glory dwells. And and then, and then because that will appear on a public stage or whatever, it'll appear like that's the spontaneous bit. We're just going to go with the flow. But you've you've kind of, it's, it's not something to plan, but it's something you can journey for. You've kind of got some steps that you know you're trying to get us into that place. Sometimes we get there, sometimes we don't. Yeah. Let's be honest. Yeah. But when we're there, you feel, how does, how, what happens then? In those, you mean in those spontaneous kind of moments? Yeah. Or, and yeah. when you feel like, you know what, we've hit it. We've hit the sweet spot where really the presence of God is here. I mean, I've watched you lead worship where you just like, just carry on. We're just going to carry on. Yeah. Because um, it is a sweet place to be. It's a sweet place and a sweet spot to be. And it, it's a really precious place to be. And I think, you know, what's so important is that we all learn how to steward those moments with God. And I think it's a ever learning, ever increasing journey in those moments, you know, and it requires us to ask the Lord in those moments, God, what are you doing in this moment? What are you saying? And something's stirring and something's happening. How do I continue to steward this? Because I don't want to miss this moment with you. And so that can look at, a, you know, a bunch of different ways. Sometimes for me, it's I'll literally start to see things in my mind's eye. That's, you know, what we might refer to as seeing in the spirit. This is while you're leading worship, right? Yeah. Sometimes there'll be those moments where God will show me pictures. He'll show me things in my mind's eye. And very often I'll run with that, especially into the prophetic and the spontaneous moments. Uh, you know, sometimes there can be a little bit of this thing in the charismatic church today, which is that the spontaneous has almost become a very popular thing to do right. uh, but I would encourage again any worshippers out there to be led by the Spirit of God let's not do the spontaneous just for the sake of being spontaneous uh, you know we know the Bible speaks about putting a new song in our mouths and that bubbling up 
but I would encourage us. Oh, I hear that wow. sound. Wow, <laughs> it's all happening here today. <laughs> but I would encourage us to really be led by the Spirit, and yeah. uh, you know, ask God to lead you within that. And yeah. I think a key is when you're in those moments where God is breathing upon something. Ask the Lord when it's right to stay on that wave and keep riding it, but also ask the Lord when is the moment where you have to move off it. Yeah, that's the brave choice, right? That's the brave choice because in that moment you have an opportunity to either take the people with you into a deeper realm of God's presence, but at the same time you have an opportunity to that being a hindrance and actually distracting and taking people away from it. And so it's really important that we become sensitive to the presence, sensitive to the voice of God, to be led by him in those moments. Yeah, which brings us full circle to your saying, well, it begins in the secret place. It begins with my personal journey and knowledge and relationship with God. And yeah. that's what overflows into the public. Steve, it's been, you're a legend, mate. I'm really enjoying yeah, our conversation. You. Um, you you have a website. Uh, yes. Can you just tell us what, what that is? And Because I know that yep. you, you journey around the UK and other places leading worship. Yeah, so you can find me. I'm on social media, Steve Tebb. Um, Facebook, Instagram, uh, uh, I think that's about it, but uh, <laughs> uh, you can check out my website at www.stevetebb.com. Uh, it's got my itinerary on there of where I'll be traveling. And so, you know, a bulk of my time is spent traveling with Catch the Fire Ministries and then uh, also full-time itinerantly teaching, training, and equipping churches um, and primarily leading worship as well. Uh, so, yeah, you can find me at stevetebb.com and that'll pretty much have everything everything you need to know there but i just as a lasting piece of advice i know you just touched on it Nick, please yeah but, and i'd love you to pray um, for us as you as you close as well yeah please. absolutely um i really want to encourage you any worshipers out there you need to know that you're created to be a worshiper you need to know that god is looking and god is raising up worshipers of spirit and in truth in this hour but that the making of a worshiper i say this to any worship team or church i go to the making of a worshiper is not found on a public place or a platform, but is always found in the private place between you and God. And so the most important thing you can do if you take anything from this podcast is going to be that you enter in to that place of knowing that you're created to worship Jesus and love Jesus, but find it in the place of his presence. Find it in the place where it's just you and him. Find it where you're worshiping for the audience of one and not for the crowds or the masses. That's really what counts and what God is after. And uh, so, yeah, let me pray for you guys. Thank you. Love that. Uh, this has been amazing. Father, I thank you for your call of worship that you've put on us, Lord. I thank you for what you're doing in the nation of the UK at the moment. Lord, we thank you that, Father, right now you're raising up worshippers all over the land. And, Father, I pray in Jesus' name that, Lord, you would release an awakening of worship right now to the hearts of every person. Lord, for the stirring of every person that watches this, I pray that you would feel a burning desire and a call in your heart that's to worship Jesus with everything inside of you. Yeah. I pray for your churches where you're ministering and where you lead, the place where God has you right now, that you begin to see an outbreak of the presence of God, that you would see the signs, wonders and miracles begin to overflow in your times of worship, but that you would see a people falling in love with Jesus, giving everything of their hearts, everything of their soul, everything of their mind and strength to him. And I pray that there would be an increase of the kingdom that begin to flow in and through your churches your ministries, your families, in Jesus' name. Come on. Amen. 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 Thanks, buddy.